so Frank, thank you very much for the first of all for funding um you know the research that we're that i'm going to talk about uh, today but also for um giving us the opportunity to to, to showcase uh, the outcomes of, of that research to date um, and as you'll see from the second presentation that's very much a work in in progress as we look to exploit the outcomes from uh, from the 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 the, the, the vmd funded project so so this first talk is going to focus on um, sustainable control of sheep scab in the presence of, of macrocyclic lactone uh, or ML uh, resistance. So Debbie's done a great job of um, introducing sheep scab. So that saves me um, a few slides so I can I can ignore that part. But I do want to just highlight this image here, which is from Neil Sargison at the Dick Vet. And it's a beautiful demonstration of all of the sort of classical signs of, of, of a scab infested flock. So you can see the wool loss down at the bottom um, left here, animals rubbing up against uh, fence posts and gates, and then the animal in the back here, um, which is obviously clearly very badly affected. And you can see it doing this sort of neck arching and lip smacking behavior, which is, is pretty classical of, um, of, of the response to sheep scab infestation. And I think it's really important that we don't um, you know, we don't forget the the fact that this is a is a is a really significant production, but also a significant welfare um, problem for for the, uh, the UK uh, sheep industry. Um, treatment only really now two treatments available: the macrocyclic lactones and organophosphate plunge uh, dipping. Um, more done uh, with funding from from DEFRA and then more latterly the Scottish Government uh, developed a, a blood test and ELISA um, and that's been available for a few years now as well um, and that that really has been a bit of a game changer in terms of how we deal with um, uh, with scab because it allows us for the first time to pick scab up before the presence of those of those uh, clinical signs um, and that means that we can start to actually get ahead of it before it has a chance to spread and it means we can coordinate our efforts and that's been really crucial um, as we now move into uh, trying to improve the methods by which we control this uh, disease uh, in the future. Um, as, as, as Debbie mentioned, uh, around about 2017 we identified the, the first cases of, um, of ML resistant mites. Um, the, this was work led by Richard Wall at Bristol and also uh, Sean Mitchell at APHA um, and it just showed that uh, that mites had, had uh, as we suspected at the time, started to develop res resistance to the MLs. Um, this was followed up with a second paper um, which just showed that or that first the first paper demonstrated resistance to moxidectin and this paper just showed that that resistance was actually uh, across all three uh, macrocyclic uh, lactones. Um, we then, we, well, I mean, I say we, Leslie Stubbings uh, and Scott, led by Scott, then organised a cross-industry meeting in 2018. Um, obviously, lots of industry were, were involved there and, and VMD played a crucial role as well. And it was to try and discuss how we how we dealt with that emerging resistance and to develop more sustainable strategies for, for dealing with scab in the future. And, and one of the outcomes from that meeting was uh, this, this VMD funded project. And there are a number of partners here. I'll, I'll come on to the acknowledgements at the end, but, but you can see there's a huge number of partners that were involved in, in this project. Um, so the main aims and outputs of the project were first of all to, to, to update the economic assessment of the true costs of scab uh, to the sheep industry. Um, I think previous estimates had, had, had looked around about sort of 8 million per year. Um, this is now estimated to cost between 80 and 200 million pounds per annum to the UK sheep industry. So the costs are, are really very significant and that's you know not taking into account that welfare burden as well. Um, we also sought to collate an analysis all of the UK-wide surveillance data for SCAB. We then combined that with modelling studies led by Bristol um, University to try and, uh, and develop management strategies for, for dealing with SCAB in the future. Oh, sorry, that's just a couple of the publications that, that came from that. Um, and one part of that was, um, was looking at, at the, the fact that SCAB does seem to uh, to see it does seem to be present in in hotspots. There are clusters, if you like, of 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 high of areas with high scab risk um, across the UK. And this is really important because it gives us key control points upon which we can focus our our efforts. And that's what we've done in the for flock sake or RDPE funded project. And I'll come on to that in a moment as well. Um, 
so what we also wanted to do was, was to take that blood test that I mentioned, but optimize how we apply that at a flock level in different control screens, and also how we interpret the outcomes of that of that blood test. Um, with the University of Nottingham, uh, we also looked at understanding the attitudes and behaviours that farmers have in relation to scab and to the control of the disease. Um, and this is really important because we can do whatever we whatever we we want in 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 the lab and you know uh, and and try to come up with these sort of strategies. But but we need to carry people with us. We need to be able to encourage farmers. Um, you know that, that there's a benefit to them by taking part in in these schemes, and and so the work here led by Jasmeet and and Fiona at Nottingham, and and largely performed by Alice uh, Smith here, who's who was a PhD student working on the project, have really given us some some fascinating insights into 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 um, attitudes towards sheep scab. We also sought to engage with a wider UK sheep industry, and we've had a huge number of sort of uh, press releases and industry um, events across the last few years to to make sure that we're carrying everybody with us on this on this journey. Um, so again, Debbie's done a great job of covering this, but basically, um, scab is endemic. Ten to fifteen percent of farmers experiencing scab every year. I suspect that's probably gone up a little eight to 10,000 outbreaks based on last winter. I would say that's definitely um, higher. Um, number of challenges to control, over-reliance on two drugs, no new drugs on the horizon either. Um, concerns around non-validated means of control, and by that I largely mean delivery of organophosphates um, through uh, showers and jetters, which have not been demonstrated to be efficacious and will highly likely contribute to the resistance developing to those uh, to the organophosphates, which will be a, a disastrous situation should that occur. Um, I mentioned about hotspots and, and that these give us an opportunity um, to target the disease, and we've we've obviously exploited that in some of these programs. Um, but coordination being absolutely critical, we have to get farmers um, to work together with their vets to try and coordinate control. Um, that threat of ML resistance reported back in 2018, and we've now got clear evidence of spread across the UK. This just shows um, the, 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 where we first identified some of the cases around the English-Welsh border region. And then if we look at the high confidence lack of efficacy reports um, for the MLs, you can see here that that is now spread to, to all parts of the UK, and I can include Northern Ireland um, in that now as well. So that problem is not going away. It's only going to, to get worse. Worse with with time. Um, one important thing is though that those ML resistant mites are still effectively controlled with an OP plunge dip. So we can always revert back to um, plunge dipping um, in cases of ML resistance. So diagnosing sheep scab, if you see, you know, a flock like this, I just thank Leslie for this picture because it's a really nice one. Um, you can see in this U here that there's a few areas, quite a lot of areas of concern, and in the lamb, a few areas of discoloration where it's probably been nibbling away. Um, you would then go, or your vet would then go and take a skin scraping, and you'd look under a microscope, and hopefully you would find one of these, this, this Seroptes mite. Um, and while that's a very specific method of, of diagnosing scab, the sensitivity of that method can be very low, as low as one in five in fact. And that's why Mordon uh, developed a, a blood test. So, so that blood test is a real game changer. It's got very high levels of sensitivity and specificity. And most importantly, it, it picks scab up before those clinical signs appear. Um, it's used as a whole flock or group test, 12 sheep uh, randomly selected from the flock or management group. And, and it is a really important tool. It's been available now for a number of years. Um, its its use has been increasing year on year, which is really encouraging. Um, but it is a bit of a game changer. We can now find scab before those clinical signs appear, before it has a chance to spread. And it means we now have a tool by which we can look to coordinate control of, of disease. Um, it's available for a number of different sources, uh, BioVest, SIUC and the Wales Vet Science Centre. And if you're lucky enough to be uh, based in Scotland, you can get funding to use the test from the Preparing for Sustainable Farming uh, scheme just now. Uh, so how does the test work? It picks up antibodies against a protein from the sheep scab mite. Debbie mentioned about their, their fecal pellets. They contain a number of allergens and it's 
the antibodies that are produced against one of these allergens called PSO2 um, that we're then picking up uh, in the blood test and it can pick it up within two weeks of an infestation. Um, those antibodies though do remain in circulation for three to six months after treatment and that means that the test can tell us if an animal has been exposed to the mite but it can't distinguish between an animal that's infested and one that's been recently treated or, or resolved. So we just need to be aware, aware of that when we're interpreting the, uh, the blood test. Um, why 12 animals? So obviously if you've got an infested animal in your flock and you randomly test uh, you know, one or a few animals, the chances of picking that up are, are fairly small. If you test 12 animals in the flock, of course, the chances are greater, but we have to balance that against testing every animal in the flock. And so 12 comes out as being a, a very good uh, uh, compromise there, um, and it gives you the best chance of detecting uh, scab in a flock should it, should it be there. Um, so testing advice for scab currently is that you should assume everything coming onto your property is a risk uh, for scab. Tops are particularly high risk and we're coming into that season uh, shortly, so just to be aware of that of that risk. Um, keep the animals separate from the rest of the flock and that's really important um, for, for two weeks at least and, and observe for signs of disease. And the reason we say two weeks is because if the animals have picked up scab on the way back to your property, for example, they may have picked it up at a market or in a trailer, then it gives them the opportunity to then zero convert on the blood test. And as, as I mentioned, those antibodies can take a, a couple of weeks to uh, develop. Um, you then test using the ELISA, or of course you can treat with an approved um, method, uh, ML or, or OP. Um, if the test is negative, then of course, you know, you can move your sheep onto the rest of the flock. And if it's positive, you can then go on and treat using the correct uh, drugs for that particular disease. Um, so testing can be cost effective. Uh, it, it stops the use of unnecessary treatments and hopefully it should slow the development of resistance. But what it also does is it gives you a definitive diagnosis. The test doesn't cross react with, with lice, which can often be uh, confused with, um, with sheep scabs. So it means you can get the right treatment to the right animal at the right time because of course sheep scab and lice uh, unless you're using an organophosphate uh, plunge dip they do require different uh, treatments so this is a good way of getting that definitive diagnosis um, so when we're interpreting that blood test so no diagnostic test is perfect this test is not perfect um, but it's pretty good um, but you can still get a small percentage of false positives and false negatives. So how do you then interpret your 12 animal uh, screen if you get a single positive result amongst those 12 animals? You could ignore it, you could believe it and, and treat everything, or you could take a risk-based approach. And, and believe it or not, it's that risk-based approach that, that, that we have uh, pursued. So you want to understand, first of all, what was the risk prior to testing? Um, how has the test result changed your opinion about that risk? And what risk are we willing to accept before we then take that decision to, uh, to treat? So just to demonstrate this uh, graphically, um, this just shows the, the test result uh, on the x-axis. And then these are the, the, the sort of the, 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 risk, the risk values here. So, um, so each line demonstrates a different level of risk. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that here. So the red line is the lowest level of risk. So it's a closed flock, no history or clinical signs of scab. And then we're going to elevate that risk profile a little bit more here to the green line where perhaps we bought in an animal. There's no clinical signs, but there's also no history available. We go to the blue line and here perhaps the neighbour has uh, has sheep scab. So that risk again is elevated further. And then finally, the purple line, our highest level of risk is uh, a flock that is exhibiting clinical or behavioural signs of, um, of scab. And so we can then change the test cutoff and our interpretation of the test depending on these risk uh, factors, which largely we can we can obtain uh, at the same time as taking the uh, the blood samples in, in in conjunction with the vet. So the test result is not a yes or no. It's it's a measurement that then needs to be interpreted. But what we want to get away from is reporting, you know, that we've got two positive tests um, in a flock. To reporting the risk or the probability that at least one individual in that group is actually infested with with scab 
So the vet needs to decide what level of risk is acceptable. And then using this model, those blood test re results are then reported to the vet with an interpretation of the flock level serological response and then suggestive actions, be that treat, no need to treat, monitor or retest. And just to show how this may look, so this plot just shows the, the blood test results or a distribution of blood test results from um, a positive flock in the red here and then a negative flock in, in the blue. And then an individual flock uh, test results, the 12 animal test results are plotted by that black line there. Um, and what you can see is that this flock clearly overlaps very nicely with that negative profile. So it's highly likely to be a, a negative um, flock. Whereas this one, which has a very a very different profile, lots of positive animals in here, but still negative animals. And that's always going to be the case, even in a severely infested flock, you're still going to have animals that are negative within that because they just haven't uh, developed the disease at that point. But you can see that clearly this one has a has a positive distribution. And we can then base that on, on, a, on, a, on a probability um, that that flock is, is positive or negative. Um, so I just want to thank um, Fiona Lovett from uh, Flock Health Limited, who's who's been part of it, part of this uh, project, because she's she's done a really nice job of of uh, of doing what I couldn't achieve, which is ho hopefully making this a bit more simple to understand. So so I just want to take you through how that interpretation might work. So so first of all, the vet and the farmer will 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 discuss and decide the flock level risk that, that that particular flock has at that particular moment in time. And the model then uses that risk level to establish a, a prior value. And you can see that up here on this chart. So, so what's the risk? Obviously a high risk, so sheep from a flock with known uh, sheep scan. Um, and we can give that then quite a, a high uh, prior value, of, in this case 0.2. And then the, the, the flip side of that is a low risk flock, um, again, it's a, it's a closed flock, no clinical signs, long term scab free history. So that prior value that we would use for that test is going to be quite low. So 0 0.01. And obviously we have different different values in between uh, to reflect different risks. There we go. Sorry. And then you obviously you've seen these um, these these uh, these lines before, which just show those different levels of risk um, then plotted onto onto our test results. Um, and just note that the higher the prior belief that the sheep is positive, the more rapid then that rise is here. So oh, sorry, let's just um, zoom forward quite quickly. Um, so what we then have is this posterior value, and it's obviously more likely that that flock is positive if that posterior value is above 0.5, above this blue line here. And it's more likely that it's going to be negative if that posterior value is below 0.5. This is an arbitrary cutoff and we can change that 0.5 cutoff depending um, on the situation. And then we have our test results here for each of those different uh, risk factors. So if we then take our different risk factors, remember for the high risk, we had a prior value of 0.2. So if you follow that through, then we would end up with a cutoff of around 0.6 by the test for that flock to be classed as positive. And then obviously for our lower risk flocks, um, we would require a much higher test result before we would be confident to say that that flock was actually positive. So you can then change how you interpret the, the flock level results depending on that risk. Um, so to be conservative, we might use that 0.5 value cutoff for, for all flocks other than those that are at very low risk. And for those, we could use a cutoff of, of one, for example. Um, and all of this is now being uh, developed into, uh, into an app, which hopefully would then take those blood test results and interpret them with just two or three small drop down questions to take in that, that risk information for, for the flock. And then you get a, a much more uh, nuanced uh, interpretation of the blood test results. So, so just to show this for a couple of flocks, again, you've seen this graph before. Um, these are the individual test results at the moment. Anything above 50 would be classed as positive. So again, you can see it compared against our our positive and our negative distributions. And the probability that this particular flock in black here is positive is 0.11. And because it's less than that 0.5 cutoff, it indicates that that flock is probably not infested with scab. And then we can take a different profile here. Again, you can see that there's one positive animal in here, a value of 88. Again, anything greater than 50 would be positive. 
But it's not just looking at that, it's looking at the distribution of all of those uh, blood test results from that flock. And again, here, the probability that this flock is positive is 0.6. So higher than 0.5 indicates that that flock is probably infested with scab. So it's just a, a, a sort of a, a finer way of, of mapping those blood test um, results. And just thanks to Fiona for, for providing that. Um, I mentioned we'd also done uh, some modelling studies, and this is preliminary data from uh, University of Bristol, um, just for some of those uh, the, some of those studies. This is looking at the impact of pre-movement treatment. So treating animals before you then move them, um, for example, to say either direct sales uh, gatherings via markets and also for win overwintering away grazing. Um, and this chart here just shows that treatment prior to movement for gatherings or markets resulted in an 86% reduction in the overall uh, risk of scab. So, so it's much more effective at reducing the overall scab prevalence than, than treatment associated with these other, other movements, for example, away grazing and direct sales. So, so markets is a very good way of, of targeting scab. It's definitely one of those uh, critical control points um, and maybe pre-treatment, uh, sorry, pre-movement treatment um, could, have a, could have an impact on that. Um, the other one is just to show about the risk of scab uh, uh, through uh, farmers treating and how, how, how that can impact on the level of disease. So um, the scab risk is dependent on the percentage of farms that treat, but it's not a linear response. So the greatest declines uh, come from a relatively small number of farms treating. So, so you can see here, this is the percentage of farms treating, and then this is a relative reduction in scab prevalence. So, so you can see you can achieve a 50% reduction in scab prevalence with just 15% of farms treating prior to moving their animals. So again, oh, sorry. Yeah. So again, small, small, uh, you know, small changes can actually have quite a big impact. And of course, if you can get up to sort of, you know, 60 percent of farms uh, treating before they move their animals, then you can have really, really high, uh, high levels of impact on the, the degree of scab. Um, the other thing to point out is that we suspect a lot of the resistant, a lot of the, the resistant mites, certainly the, the longer distance movement of resistant mites is, is due to, you know, to, uh, to, uh, uh, movement of animals through through markets and uh, and sales. So, so it's a good way of, of also impacting on, on the movement of resistant mites. Um, so again, these results suggest that targeted pre-movement treatment is likely to make an important contribution to national scab control. And it was just to thank, um, sorry, let's skip forward, just to thank uh, Katie, uh, Richard Wall and uh, Emily Nixon for, 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 for providing those results. And I think that's all going into a publication quite soon as well. Um, so main outcomes from this project to date are that sheep scab is, uh, is endemic across the UK, spreading at a local level from farm to farm with long distance movements contributing to its spread. Um, the disease is likely to be far more widespread than previously thought and subclinical disease is a significant contributor to this problem. Um, without intervention, that situation is not going to improve. Um, it's clear that farmers and vets struggle to diagnose a disease based on the presence of clinical signs alone and that a scab ELISA is a real game changer, allowing us to, to, to get ahead of the spread of the disease um, and allowing us to coordinate and target our treatments to ensure the efficacy of the treatments that we, that we do have available. Um, and also, I think it's important to know the incorporation of that testing as part of future flock health plans. I've mentioned about the scheme in Scotland, but also through the animal health pathway um, will we'll look will we'll hopefully increase the uptake of that that uh, test. So why look to control scab now? So resistance to the injectables means that in the future we, we will only have the OP plunge dips. Um, resistance to those will come. It's just a matter of time. Um, and obviously we want to make sure that that is as, as far into the future as possible. And at the moment, no new drugs on the horizon. This is a good time to take action because there's the will to act from government and from, from industry. We've shown that through the, the various schemes that are running at the moment. The injectables do still work and they will continue to have a role in control. We just have to use them uh, carefully. Um, OP plunge dipping is available and it's very efficacious if used correctly, but not if delivered through showers and jetters. Um, we have a, a blood test available that does allow us to, uh, to target those treatments. 
Um, but any schemes, any control efforts have to be joined up and we have to look at the successes and, and the failures from previous schemes um, in order to drive that. Um, in the future, Mordun is developing a sheep scab vaccine, but again, that's not going to be available for a few years yet and in itself will not be a silver bullet for, for sheep scab. Um, so we generate a bit of a roadmap and I'll, I'll very quickly take you through this. So phase one is kind of where we are now, um, increasing awareness of SCAB, providing best practice advice, which SCOPS does a, an excellent job, increasing the availability and the, and the awareness of the, of the test and how to best use it, um, improved interpretation of those test outcomes, which we've been achieving through this uh, VMD funded project. And then the importance of coordinated efforts built on exemplars of previous success. And I'll talk about the RDPE project and, and others in a moment as well. And then some of the lessons from that RDPE project, which are cooperation and communication being critical to success, highlighting the benefits of blood testing versus blanket treatments, and of course, the presence of subclinical um, uh, uh, sheep scab. Phase two is where we start to realise the longer term benefits of targeting those hotspots and targeting those animal movements. Um, we then broaden our efforts on to those um, in those hotspots and looking at those critical control points. So modelling studies predict that hotspot approaches give you gains locally, but they can also have an impact nationwide as well. And the same applies to those long distance uh, movements. Um, so how do you then maintain control of a scab once the prevalence has been impacted? And again, that's another question entirely, because as you reduce the prevalence of, of disease, it becomes um, more difficult to then, to then detect the disease. So that, that's another challenge as well. Um, using this approach as an exemplar of how you can bring together people to achieve control, not just of sheep scab, but of other endemic diseases. And then finally, in phase three, coordinated efforts to control disease and gain broader traction. Of course, these all need funding. Um, the longer term appreciation of the benefits of testing versus blanket treatment, maintaining efficacy of the drugs that we have, um, and then combining to reduce the incidence of scab, lessening the burden, increasing productivity, reducing those welfare harms and creating an opportunity for lasting control of scab. And all of that hopefully should coincide with the introduction of that vaccine, which will give us more, more tools to achieve sustainable control of scab in the future. And, but that's on a, currently on a five year research plan from Scottish government. So the vaccine is not going to be available uh, immediately. Um, and then finally, just to acknowledge a huge number of people that have been involved um, in all of these projects. So we have many, many individuals from uh, Bristol University, Nottingham University, Glasgow, Biobest, um, SCOPS, of course, uh, EPIC, uh, Mordun uh, and, and BIOS, and of course the funding from uh, the VMD as well. So